And we are going live. Last second check on everything. Oh, that's all right. There we go. Welcome to the third Geek Out session, where we'll be geeking out today to Ascend Online, book one by Luke Chmelenko. Best attempt on last name there. Um, I'm your host, Carl Williams, here at the channel Geek on My Sleeve, where we just have fun geeking out to some of our favorite books. And uh, yeah, look forward to um, you joining the discussion in chat or in the comments below if you catch us after the live stream. Today, I have my co-host, uh, Peter Williams for this geek out session. We do a lot of geeking out in real life um, to all sorts of books. So he was just a natural partner for this project here. Um, and yeah, looking forward to geeking out with you, Pete. Hello, hello. There we go. Um, yeah, so spoiler warning ahead. Uh, if you haven't read Ascend Online, there will be spoilers. Um, stop now, come back, watch it after the fact. Worth checking out, especially if you like MMORPGs and fantasy type uh, stories. Um, and also a graphic language warning. Uh, this storyline follows a group of friends who are gaming together, and sometimes the jokes could be considered offensive. Not too severe, in my humble fit opinion but uh yeah just fair warning on language as well so before getting into the book um one of the reasons why i really love it is if you're a gamer and you grew up playing like world of warcraft or everquest or even like runescape um there's so many points in this book that uh you just feel like you're there playing your favorite mmo again it's just so natural uh pete you uh have probably played a fair share more mmorpgs than i have what are some of uh what have you logged some hours on uh, i think we're we're pretty close in all of it um kind of the first mmo if it could be called that was runescape for me yeah the I... uh the click magnet but the one that really took it off or really catapulted me forward with it all was WoW. I played through Vanilla up until Burning Crusades. Kind of fell off with it just due to life and everything else going on. I, uh, I forget the slash command, but I think it was like time played. Yeah. And um, I'm embarrassed to admit my first Vanilla WoW character uh or like main level 60 my slash play time i remember sitting there thinking i could have learned another language with how many hours i've logged into this or um some useful skill though video gaming um it, it yeah i i don't want to say it's a not useful but um yeah a lot of hours logged i don't know i've, I've learned a lot from it like uh I remember, wow, you had a guild going, so I got to work on my, you know, everybody's a vital aspect of the team element. You know, everybody yes. has a role to play and, you know, just getting out there and communicating with people and trying the to main, figure out new boss strategies. And The main know. character even talks about that at one point in this book. He's like, hmm, I wonder if I could put this on my resume, you know. Yeah. Um, he was a little bit more cynical about it, not really playing up all the, you know, leadership aspect or you know um guild management etc cetera, etc cetera. uh i have to look up the quote he his was a little bit more um sinister i think but uh yeah you do learn a lot of skills and teamwork and um yeah just hanging out with friends from all over the world yeah so that was the first one who really got me involved with it but then i played a lot of uh, Star Wars: The Old Republic, yeah. Which that one was similar yet completely different. I enjoyed the the cinemas. Um, 
and kind of I ended up playing a lot more end game stuff with it with the raids. But even in just the three that you mentioned right there, right? The progression and just the game mechanics as well as um combat uh graphics just everything just has scaled so quickly in 10 years that's what's kind of interesting about this book where it's like 2047 i think is when it starts out um how far technology and video games can progress in you know those decades right yeah going going from runescape where (laughs) you talk about a grind at one point um i think larian was talking to maybe writ or whatnot when uh they were um talking about adventurers getting them to do all the gathering and stuff for them and the grind and the npc writ is like you know are they really going to want to do that and larian's like yeah if i know adventurers they'll they'll grind stuff out for um you know if if it's rewarding enough and runescape i mean how many hours i spent fishing just to level that up where you're literally just clicking right um yep. but yeah that's the only thing that's kind of exciting about the uh ascend online going forward is just the scale and the difference and progression throughout it all yeah yeah it yeah it definitely scales and builds pretty quick um, and just the first book alone. But yeah, sorry, what other MMOs? Um, oh, uh, the big one that was kind of a game changer, because all those were kind of tab targeting, was Wildstar for me. Because it wasn't like overly graphically amazing. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of content. It was a little on the shorter side. But the thing that got me was the telegraphing. And how it was no longer tab targeting and it wasn't just about, you know, setting up your macros for your button rotation. There was a lot more maneuverability and mechanics. Yeah, yeah. You actually kind of felt more involved with the combat, if you will. Um, But yeah, that, that, I mean, there's so many good lit RPGs out there where a lot of them are kind of in the VR timeline and just the potential there um with the gameplay uh i could list half a dozen animes too like sword art online where it's just like the full immersion and um not to get too ahead of us but the book does a good job kind of showing that right where in the first chapter he's using the VR that we kind of are are starting to get into today, right? Where you have the goggles and um, the haptic gear and the sensor is actually placed on you. Right, right. You know, you're you're literally running. And um, when I talk to old school gamers, that's that's a lot of the pushback I get from the VR stuff. They're like, you know, when I play video games, I just want to sit down and play video games. I don't want to be running and jumping like I'm in the game. Um, but like the full immersion, uh, it, you're basically plugged in, right? So you just have to think the controls. Yeah. Um, Are right, we ready to start yeah. from the beginning here? Yeah. I, Wildstar had so much potential. Um, those of you watching live and or join us later, if you are a gamer, um, we'd love to hear uh what mmo kind of got you into the genre if you will um i haven't checked lately but world of warcraft has something in the double digits as far as millions subscribers right oh um, they're they're still the the king yeah pioneer and the king yeah um that's another thing that yeah we'll we'll get into it i don't want to get too far ahead so uh want to do our best to stick chronologically but as we go down the rabbit hole bear with us a little bit um, feel free to share your thoughts and chat um, as well 
And yeah, so he opens up an augmented reality exercise simulator, right? And uh, as we talked about earlier, using the more traditional VR that we're familiar with. And um, one of his old gaming buddies, Peter, hits up Marcus. And this MMO out of nowhere uh, gets announced, which to me is unheard of. Like, how many MMOs have snuck up on you? They're always announced years out, right? Yeah, that and all the uh, beta testing or yeah. other involvement. Yeah, and, and you would think that most MMOs would have that, um, where they go through the different phases. I, I can think of a handful, uh, especially when they do like the crowdfunding, which it, in Ascend Online, it's obviously not crowdfunded. Um, but still, that's like one of the perks and how they they get their feedback. So to have a game completely launch with no word getting out, I think it's the day before that um, anybody even hears anything about it, right? Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, they announce that they're going to have a live stream and that they're going to release the next day. You have the right. live stream and then it's it's right on to it. Yeah. And um, they basically just dump all sorts of information on them. I think uh, going from memory, they dumped oh, 600 pages of lore the night before. Um, and one of the things that I know I enjoyed in MMOs was when it wasn't overly... Um, what's the terminology they use like metagaming right where you have these guys sitting down trying to break it down to a science on the best class combo or um, have all the dungeons and stuff farm to where it's you know your patterns for not stepping into aoes and when to attack the boss and um so on and so forth yeah that was something that was pretty refreshing with it so, I don't know, he's, I think he talks about it once he gets into the character creation, uh, where he's like, normally, by the time anything's ever launched, he's already got, you know, build suggestions and right. boss strategies. and Yeah, yeah. So, um, you, we're, we're getting that fresh perspective throughout the story, which is nice. Um, and they also work it out to where the stream has to be delayed 10 days, um, which there's a lot of perks to that. But again, to kind of combat the metagaming as well as uh, it, it keeps it fresh, right? Because if there's enemy um, PvP factions or whatnot that want to see what you're up to, having a 10-day lag before they can see what you were doing uh, gives you at least 10 days of surprise or uh head start or whatnot right yeah yeah um, that way you can play out your storyline without real interference yeah which again it um it's nice and i think that's some of those details are what made the book feel like an actual fantasy at time and really allow you the immersion because it gets away from the uh, metagaming and you know um all that stuff, they kind of just have to figure it out as they go and make the best of what they have. Um, but yeah, they show up, it's packed. Um, this group of gamers has been playing together for years. And as we talked about earlier, uh, one of the things that kept me involved with MMOs for so long is the the social component um you keep track of your friends but you get on different work schedules you move after college so on and so forth or you make new online gaming friends and uh yeah it, it allows you to stay connected and still share your gaming passion together so they all sign up um they get like a group subscription i believe and work yeah, out all yeah, those details uh, they it's pretty much like a shared apartment but yeah they all pay for it together yeah which is um another kind of interesting thing 
but the subscriptions I thought were interesting because currently you have like what free to play where they do the microtransactions and just all those different things. But for this, like their subscription models are how long you stay in there. Right. And they went all the way hardcore 10 days, max immersion in that little apartment type thing. And um, yeah, but you could do like a daily, weekly, monthly, short-term play, long-term play um for the casuals and not not to get too far ahead of myself but one of the things that i thought was interesting about how they deal with the logouts one of the biggest challenges that i face when playing an mmo is it comes like a second job right where if you have stuff you're supposed to do you need to get it queued or you need to do your dailies or so on and so forth so um if you're a casual player and you log out the AI or whatnot takes over and kind of like keeps your character alive in game, which was just something as uh, someone who went kind of from maybe a little bit more hardcore to a casual gamer is like, wow, that would solve so many of my problems about keeping involved with the world and the storyline. And, yeah. uh, and that's, that's kind of a good segue for the nanobots. Because uh, right. they're talking about how they've got, you know, skill upgrades and it kind of like imprints knowledge for you. Uh, mm-hmm. Kind of same thing. As soon as you come back, it, it kind of like does a recap of what all has happened during your time away. And speak going back a little bit, speaking on the long term play. Um, it's kind of, you know, the book does well incorporating the nanobots and making it realistic for someone to be sitting in a capsule for 10 days at a time. You know, that's nothing that we could do now, but you know, with that technology and it's mainly for the medical side of things. Um, I think the quote is, uh, the millennials are not retiring because they can work for an extra 10 years or sorry, an extra, I think it was like five to 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Work an extra five to 10 years and be able to get 80 plus years with the correct mix of the nanobots. And it's supposed to help um, cure cancer and heart disease and obesity. And so that's really where it's getting its funding and its technological advances from. Something else I was thinking of that they don't really address, but, you know, as as we were talking about it offline about the nanobots um, with how they essentially upload information into your brain or whatnot. Think about the implications for like job training and education and whatnot. If you need an actual real life skill and um, you could do some VR work and you know get the fundamentals down or the muscle memory down or whatnot and then just have the necessary information uploaded um man that would make job training a whole lot easier yeah yeah i think yet again at the beginning of it there'd be the uh the cost because kind of like the overhead going forward with this a lot of their cost is you know the the continue immersion but like anything new it's going to cost more yeah so um terms of agreements papers uh, i I don't know how many people actually read terms of service but i think it was marcus admitted he was like one of the few people that actually read it but as they're getting uploaded into the capsule and everything um they basically surprise inject them and then announce or or give them the terms of agreement. And I wanted to read it real quick. Uh, Before we can complete the login process, CTI's legal team requires me to remind you by signing the terms of agreement papers, you have fully agreed to all aspects uh, of CTI's terms and use policy, which outlines your rights and responsibilities as players. Furthermore, you have agreed not to seek legal action against CTI or hold or or its holdings due to in-game experiences that are of a non-technical nature. And this is the interesting part. Uh, this includes, but not limited to, pain, 
torture, dismemberment, burning, drowning, uh, repeated simulated death, also emotional and or physical physiological harm included by playing ascend online is taken at the player's risk in the event of a mental break or descend into sociopathy cti is happy to provide ptsd grief counseling personality editing and limited memory wipes at a nominal fee uh tongue twister but yeah just like to keep that in the back of your mind as you go through and see what these players experience in the game. Um, no wonder they include some of uh, some of that, right? Yeah, yeah, it's always... Our companies are pretty good at covering their butts nowadays. Right, but just... Uh, it, it's a game, but they, they allude to it, or they even talk to it about it directly uh, as far as... Um, how real the game feels. So to go through combat and initially, I think their first patch was to turn down the pain threshold, right? Yeah, yeah, due to numerous complaints, <laughs> CTIs lowered, I think it was like by 50%. Yeah, yeah, not, not to get ahead of myself, but uh, like I think it was Constantine and Lyrian were talking uh, when they finally connect. I don't know about you, but what playing games when you don't have fall damage in you just go running around the city oh i'm on floor three i need to get down to the the ground why why take the stairs i could just jump off this ledge right yeah and And, the guy screaming in pain and they thought i was just playing that up yeah yeah um i don't know it how would you feel about um that level of pain in a video game I, I think like anything, it would add the realism, which is a complete step forward. You know, currently we've got our VR as we know it, where it's like taking up your whole vision. So you kind of feel a little more integrated. Um, right. Of course, that's going to be one of the things that they're going to be able to tweak it or turn it on or turn it off. Uh, for example, um, playing Black Desert, there's always music going and it just got to the point it just bugged me so i just turned it completely off so as long as the options there i think it's it would be a good addition um but yeah that yeah that's true i i agree on all points and you would think that there would be a way to kind of scale that down right yeah. or adjust it um they don't talk about that in the book but one would hope cuz everybody has a little bit different pain threshold yeah. Um, but yeah. But I guess on that note, um, they talk about how it's very real in the moment, but that it works on your, or uh, your, uh, oh, I can't think of the word, your psyche for it to become less, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, less yeah. memorable, but, uh, yeah, you're right. They talk about how with. exactly. I guess that's true. I, I kind of forgot about that aspect where um, they mentioned that it, it doesn't really linger that long, right? Yeah. Especially after they heal, which is, um, yeah, interesting. But yeah, so character creation, super in depth. Um, main character, Marcus, gets. Uh, kind of lost on the character creation mode. I I have a love-hate relationship personally with character creation because usually after all the hype, uh, I just want to get into the game and start playing. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I think there's there's been a couple MMOs that have allowed you to do the character, character creation before launch, right? Uh, yeah, I think Black Desert did one. And Black Desert is, like, really graphically advanced i would say where Mm -hmm. you could they had like a a completely separate app that you could create your character tweak how it looks you know change the lighting change you know all that and then it like uh, saved it as a template where then you could load it in right but for me i'm the exact opposite i just i spam the random button 
and where I get stuck is the name. <laughs> it's always hard. And uh, with how quickly Ascend Online grows, um, it'll be interesting in later books if uh, some of the names get pretty creative. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I think they talked about at one point a nearly 200 million person waiting list to get into yeah. the game like can you imagine trying to find a name being the 200 millionth player um <laughs> yeah another thing that was kind of different for me is they had like a first and a last name which right you know they don't really utilize them but it, it kind of helps with the immersion and I mm-hmm. think that will help with the overlap because I guess for work for me, we've got two people with the same name. So we either shorten one or we go by the last name. Or That's true. That's true. I guess if they include the whole name, you have a couple more options. It won't be big boy 76 or whatever spelled yeah. out. Um, but now all the character names are very realistic, which is nice. Or I don't know if realistic is the right word. It there are times where I forget it's an lit RPG and it just feels like another fantasy book, um, especially when they're interacting with the NPCs. It's more of when you get them out as a party that you get kind of that gamer banter back and forth with uh, the old jokes and um, puns and whatnot. Yeah. For uh, the... oh. no, go ahead. For the character creation, I felt like there was a whole lot of foreshadowing or potential with it because it's talking about all the different races. And granted, our team has already talked about where they're going to try to land or where they're going to start out. And so that kind of narrows down what what we really glimpse. But it talks about like the bestial races and a little bit of lore we've got. So... Nothing really touched on in this book for it, but I'm just waiting for other factions or other areas to get integrated. Yeah. Yeah, no, they uh, they did a good job with that. And um, uh, character creation, it, it, was, it was a nice little peek into the game. Good setup. Yeah, I mean, main character went... As a human, nothing too crazy, but the whole party is a wide range of characters. And uh, it, it, a bit of humor early on where uh, he's interacting with the god creativity, um, which I, is an interesting thought that I'd like to come back to, just kind of how the gods interact with the world. Um, but it took took him very literal when he was talking about... Uh, what he wanted in his character creation, right? No, I don't need armor. I just want this spell book. And then he gets, he's unable to load into the starting area with all his buddies and gets sent to, was it Alfred? Um, um, I have this written down somewhere. Now all I can think about is Alfred. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just go with it for now. Um, but yeah, and just thrown into combat, and I, that's a lot of books get caught up in the world building, and I could see the temptation, especially with an MMO and how much detail goes into a game, right? But by chapter four or whatnot, a couple pages in, you're thrown right into combat, and uh, this town is getting attacked by goblins, and it shows us the pain threshold. Um, as well as just the the realism to your level one fishy or nub or whatnot, right? And just chuckling along as he figures out combat and what's going on. Um, on that note, that was something that I really liked how they integrated because our main character, we first meet him in the Aries. You know, he's doing more physical combat type style things and Mm -hmm. as soon as he gets dropped in you know he's got a sword and he's like oh this is neat boom you got a (laughs) goblin and he completely whips it with the sword and then he ends up you know (laughs) killing the goblin with his bare hand so it's it's cool how with the character progression it all integrates i i enjoyed that yeah the little details 
Well, yeah, and um, we talked about this a bit offline where uh, it's so many stories, the, the characters are just epic, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, and, overpowerful. Yeah, and you, you see the struggle with these characters, and it's definitely the struggle in that opening combat. I think uh, at one point he ends up leveling up his unarmed combat, right, just because... Uh, he can't keep track of his sword or whatnot. Um, and then, yeah, first first achievement unlocked uh, after the initial battle. Um, what was it? Like, or the... nudist or whatnot. <laughs> right. So, so we meet the Bon, and he's like, uh, uh, leader of the town. <laughs> Do you realize you're naked? Oh, yeah. Uh, let's go to a baker's <laughs> dozen worth of goblins with my cock hanging out. It's like, right. <laughs> they talk, he he did tell creativity he didn't need any armor, right? And he, he in the character creation, he had uh, at least underwear. Um, but uh, yeah, he talked about the immersion of the VR. I wonder how, how intense the fight had to be that he didn't realize he was running around and fighting for his life completely naked. Um, but yeah, it gets, gets you a bit of a, a chuckle after going from the extreme um, combat and pain and chaos that was his opening fight to um, take you back a bit. And then, yeah, the, the NPCs, um, I, I've played a lot of MMOs where the NPCs are realistic to a certain degree, and there's been some games that have done a really good job that make you feel that way, especially um, like uh, Star Wars Old Republic, where they had so many cutscenes and voiceovers, and it wasn't just the same repetitive voice and response all the time. But uh, in this book, and again, it, it this could happen in our lifetime with the AIs to get just this intelligent in video games. They feel like real people. Um, yeah. And on that note, uh, kind of like, wow, they had like something for you to read, but it almost felt like over the top and I don't mm -hmm. skip it. But then like you're saying for star Wars, the level of immersion with the cinemas was great. Right. But then kind of the first real, you know, insight to independence on the NPCs here was after he kills the goblins outside the uh, smithy and they go in and we're learning that the goblins are um, carrying away or capturing all the townspeople. And yeah. they're like, they're like are Jenkins well, and, and Rit, the, yeah, he, goes, yeah. he goes to save them. and. Um, not to cut you off, but I think it was Jenkins, right? That kind of pushed back when he tried to just say, no, you go be safe or whatever, right? Yep, yep, it was. It was uh, Jenkins, or Lyrian was like, hey, so we've got everything set up at the town hall. I was sent here by Bon Aldwin to bring you back. And he's like, right. forget that. I, I got to go save these people. You know, I thought you had Stone's adventure. And then mm -hmm. Rin's like, it. Hey, it, it's not going to happen. He's not going to accept <laughs> no for an answer. Right. But yeah, it, uh, if they can have that kind of detail and AI intelligence and the NPCs, when you log out, right, they basically seed your avatar with an AI that has learned your preferences and behaviors. Um, kind of makes you wonder at what point do you realize you're interacting with somebody live even um or just their their ai yeah and then not to get too far ahead but so the ars ais are very interactive and kind of their own person but just the world as a whole it seems like events on top of events are really yeah depicting it, how the world is going which would be exciting for me cuz right now it's all you know not necessarily a cookie cutter, but it feels it's all organic, generic, right? Like yeah. basically, the players have impact on the world, and the world has the impact on the players and the NPCs, and it just, uh, it's not 
patch updates, right? It's yeah. Uh, the this group of mobs has gotten out of control and are taking over this area. Uh, the NPCs, you know, on the spot quest. Hey, we we need you to help us combat this, right? Like with the the werewood spiders. Um, well, yeah, for the goblin raid, you know, if he didn't yeah, spawn the there, I I mean, there would have been a lot less people. And then right. now with going forward with the spiders, I mean, if they weren't there, would have been a completely different story. Kind of kind of makes you wonder uh, when creativity and was it destruction. The two yeah. sister gods, the AIs, um, their their interaction every now and then we get a, an interlude with them throughout the story, and it kind of makes you wonder creativity's agenda, right? The fact that she chose his spawn, she's the one that said, "Close your eyes, and when you open them, you know you'll be where you're supposed to go." And um, or, yeah. well, I thought so. She tried to put him at the capital in Iberia, but okay. due to the king being a total twat or how right. say it, <laughs> he had his call to arm ceremony, it got, yeah. you know, skewed. Not to say that she didn't, you know, foresee it in the weave or manipulate it by any means, but Right. Yeah, it, it could have been the system that redirected him. Um kind of makes you wonder what happened if he uploaded in a capital completely naked. Uh, they might yeah. not have the same casual uh, achievement unlocked, new title mentality. More like uh, go sit in the jail where when you're in the jail, you actually have to have an in-game timer, right? It's not just... Yeah, oh, you can't log out. Well, you can, you can log out, but the timer stops. So if yeah. you get like seven days jail time, you're basically paying this elite subscription to literally sit in jail. So uh, you can't just go doing whatever you want in the capital, slaying NPCs or a little bit more severe than when uh, I'm thinking of um, Elder Scrolls games when you're trying to get away with pickpocketing people in the capital. Yeah. But yeah, so the character names, as we go back and forth, uh, name drop multiple, but it was Marcus for Lyrian. Uh, Peter chose Constantine. Deckard chose Drace. Zach chose Caius. Huron chose uh, Halcyon. And Misha chose Sierra. And... Yeah, it's, um, I don't know, when I've been gaming with friends, it, it really just depends. After a while, I found that you kind of go back and forth when you're playing using real life names and gamer tags, but some of my online friends, I just knew them as their gamer tag, right? Especially yeah. when you're in a, in a bigger chat, like guild chat or whatnot. Um, but yeah, after the combat's over, he talks to Constantine, they catch up, and we get like our first dose of uh lore, right? Um no, we get, we our, get the dose yeah, of that, lore that's later. When they come back. Uh the right. first day, once he, he kills the goblins, complete the quest, you know, uh the town save. Um I'm gonna remember the name of it. Anyway, yeah, um, I'll look he it up. saves it. And then that's when we figure out Alford. about what's it? Alford. It is Alford. Okay. I think I said uh, er, but yeah. Once once they figure out um where Lyrian is, they kinda depict the map and how everything's kind of blocked off and is real defensible and how they can get there. Right. Right. And then, um yeah, they they link up, they overhear um the shortcut, right? Yeah, Did yeah, they're talking that? to the server the surveying guild because they've got a map they can use and they overhear, mm-hmm. you know, people saying, Hey, there's a shortcut. Right. Um Yeah. I, I know we're not quite at that point, but just when they start telling the story about um their their journey there, uh 
some good laughs. But yeah, is uh, day one when he goes out and gets his first nemesis? Or yeah, yeah. Nemesis? Day one, day or well, I guess a little bit after that, he kind of gets uh, geared up or beginning stuff where he gets his primers for like his blacksmithing, leatherworking, cooking, right? You know, all that, and then yeah, he's he's out and talking about the area. I really like how uh, they do the crafting and ascend online. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's been games where, and I, he talks about this too, and that's part of what makes just the book so realistic to me is like uh, the writer obviously understands MMORPGs and the challenges because like he talks about in the book, I've had games where it's just exhausting. You want to craft, but you have to be just grinding out thousands of daggers and leveling up um, all these different trees and everything just to do anything. Um, But then to have the actual skill leveling up and give you some creative freedom to kind of play and tinker with it and use your imagination. Uh, Yeah. That was, that was another thing that, I kind of feel like our main guy got an edge with, but isn't going to be unlocked for everyone. Oh, what's the skill? Oh, Uh, yeah. I remember uh, what you were talking about. He got the, sorry, not skill, trait. He got the trait open-minded where he can learn uh, race lock traits. He gets a skill XP buff. And in our very first day after the goblin raid, he starts breaking down the materials and he learns another skill, improvise or improvisation, where he's no longer locked into using the traditional materials yes. for it. And you know, yet again, we're not overpowered, but it it's all adding up. And it's within the framework of the game and just opens other possibilities. Yeah, it. Um, I I enjoy games like that, and they try to have that like sandbox approach, right? Where you can just uh, let your your creativity one run wild and just impact on the world. And um, if they if they can upload information into your brain, can it, does it work in reverse? Right? Can the world learn what you already know and find ways to incorporate that into uh, the world, or maybe um that'd be interesting the only thing on that for me was when he's first getting in it and he's like oh oh dang this hurts you know getting stabbed and he starts sneaking around and he learns stealth Mm -hmm. and then later on uh he's learning skills from other people on his team yeah and in the in the vr um your actions have to match up right you know when you go to block uh, they talk about as they level up or they skill up and they learn more information, they learn how to hold a sword. They learn how to properly position their bodies and whatnot to parry and to do all that. So it makes sense if you already knew some of that, you'd be more of a natural at skilling up. Um, but yeah. It... So I guess progression onto the first day. We saved the the village. We're now going out. Um, He's, you know, killing a couple things. Uh, He ends up finding out that if you don't eat, you don't regenerate. That's kind of something I wish they touch more on in the book. I Mm -hmm. like it because he's got that quote where he's like, oh, I hope looking back on this, you know, I'll... I'll reminisce while I'm eating a, uh, you know, dragon steak or something. <laughs> yeah, right. When he's, uh, was it like snake and beetles or yeah, whatnot? Yeah, yeah, snake day? and beetle meat. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, again, it, I've heard of gamers where there's a fine line in how much realism they really want in an MLRPG. Do you really want to, um, have the sensation of beetles on your mouth. I know different cultures eat different things, but as a player, I know plenty of picky eaters that would um, probably struggle with that if they had to eat some lower ranked foods. I could also see that making for an interesting auction house economy, right? More uh, delicate dishes 
pay a little bit extra to eat a cheeseburger and fries or whatever your vice is versus um, spider meat. <laughs> but kind of going back to the nanobots, just from all over the place, it's uh, for they talk about 10 days. You've got to then take a 24 rest period or 24 dose of reality. And I feel right. like incorporating the eating and the cooking helps your mind kind of wrap around. This isn't so That's different. True. And even yeah. though your body's getting the nourishment from the nanobots, it, you know, keeps your mental, your mental all together. Yeah. Eat no, I, and parts, parsnip, ink, cricket flour. Uh, yeah. You know, I bet I bet they have it in there. They use anything that is edible um, for recipes, it seems. If there's meat on it, you can cook it. Or if there's well, protein. And then down the line, when he starts asking his buddies, hey, has anyone tried to learn cooking? The guy's <laughs> like, well, I burned water once. Right. Stick well, to he, prepackages. He's, yeah, he's not going to enjoy it or be as involved with it yeah you make a good point though i didn't think about that with the uh with the 10 days in um since it is so real your body gets used to certain things right if you have your routine as far as eating or whatnot even when you play a traditional mmo um you still have to do that part of your routine um but yeah i'm not sure that one guy but yeah Wow, killed a guy. He uh, he was up for seven days straight playing. Oh my goodness, that's that's an that's an addiction right there. Um, but you brought up the uh, the ten days on, one day off cycle, and how it, a dose of reality. Um, I can think of several gamer friends that have just gone on binges where the logic of the game. Um, it's just kind of like running on a subconscious level yeah. where uh, I've had friends tell me um, what is, what is it in league of legends? The blink? Is it blink? Yeah, the flash? flash. Or, I can't remember if it's flash or blink, but just wanting to be able to flash through something to get yeah. through. Yeah. To where you teleport. And if you've just been used to using it, um, I had a buddy tell me like he was at a store or something and didn't want to walk. And he, he had a legitimate thought like, Oh, I should just flash. And it was it was kind of a, a reality check, like, oh wait, I can't do that right now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, welcome back to reality. Um, but yeah, so kind down of the rabbit hole. Finishing off the first day, so as he's eating, um, he gets attacked because he's still out in the wild. And mm -hmm. so he manages to fend off the first Puma. And then he's like, well, I'm still not regenerating. And he goes, he's, he has a little lull where he's like, oh, I wonder if the five second rule counts in, yep. you know, virtual reality. And he goes to pick it up and there's a Puma that swats it back down. And we kind of get our, Puma. yeah, and we get our <laughs> kind of chase scene going and he's like, oh, I've got it. I'm, I'm, I'm bobbing. I'm weaving. I'm going. And then all of a sudden he's like out of stamina and he's like, Oh, well, guess I'm food. Yeah. Harsh but, way to learn, learn your limit. Right. Um, yeah. the game mechanics, when you got a giant Puma chasing you. Um, but yeah. And then, uh, we get to explore a little bit more territory, right? Or he, well, the, the point on that is he, he does get away from the Puma, which then, uh, marks him as a nemesis, so he's going to continue hunting him and getting stronger, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. for me is a new mechanic for games. Yeah, I I really enjoy enjoyed that aspect of some of the MMOs, like to to where your character is unique, right? You interact with the world, and then real world or virtual world events. Um, kind of impact you and you get a nemesis or you get a familiar or, you know, um, your character's age or show battle scars or whatnot just kind of brings that extra level to the realism. Um, but yeah, 
a nemesis bond is formed where it grows and gets stronger. I, I, I think I talked to you about this offline. I wonder if the author is a fan of the, I think it's Forgotten Realms, the one where it has Dritz and uh, his oh, yeah, bonded he's... cat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so then he gets off track, goes into the water where he's able to at least quench his thirst, right? Yeah. And explore um, the town. And uh, he had several uh, facepalm moments with, uh, like, earlier starting a fire, wishing he had some... Um, or bought a tinderbox. Yeah, yeah. And then the same thing when it's dark. He's like, oh, wait, I'm a, I'm, I'm a walking torch. I got oh, yeah. this. I mean, that was a good developmental moment for me because he was like, oh, hey, you know, I'm using my sword as a blind man cane. And then he ends up falling into it. And he's like, oh, you know, I just went through this. I can use it as a torch. <laughs> but right. it leads up to finding the ruins and battling the skeleton and uh, finding the sword that he then reforges. And getting Getting some other achievements for being the first. Yeah. Like, in a lot of ways, he is so well off by being thrown in a pioneer town, right? Where you can just get into it instead of just doing the basic fetch quests or tutorial quests in the main city. Um, but yeah, you, you kind of see some of that as he, he stumbles along and figures out the game mechanics in a sink or swim environment instead of... Uh, safe cushy city where you know whatever you need it's right there it's available um but yeah i really like how the combat is done in the book you really feel like you're there just thinking through some of those earlier fights that he had and even later with the pvp um but yeah, yeah. You really feel like you're there, and yet again, they're not overpowered. They're working through the fight, you know, kind of like the skeleton, for example. <clears throat> he, at the very beginning, he kind of gets an insight. Okay, it's slow, it's missing limbs, you know, so he's got some potential there, but he's trying to hack it with his sword, and it's not working out so well. And then, you know, out of sheer dumb luck or whatever, he ends up smashing the skull. So then, you know, the revolution or re revelation of, hey, skeletons are weak to blunt damage kind of gives you the insight. And it was it was just dumb luck the way it all played out for him. Yeah, that it's not just damage, right? It's not just, oh, I can equip whatever main hand and it's based off damage that the actual style of weapon um, has strength and weaknesses against different uh, enemy types, right? Yeah. Um, that's pretty much the end of day one for us, right? So day two, uh, oh, he he gets to meet the cook, right? Was it Ragnarok or Ragna? Yeah, Ragna, not Ragnarok. Um, but yeah, uh, again, the the characters are so developed. She's a half orc and what not, right? Is a half orc. I w yeah, that that sounds right. She she's a halfling of some sort. So you get to see a bit of the world diversity and the different um kind of race types and how the NPCs they're not all just vanilla. They they have a little bit of their own flavor based off of their background just like the the adventurers do. Um but yeah, he he befriends her giving her some of his her loot and it's moments like that when they interact with the NPC where you get like the level updates or like the item updates that for me it was one of those moments that I'm it's I'm not I'm no longer reading a fantasy book, right? It's a lit RPG where it's like, oh, even though this is so real as virtual reality should be, he has a stack of twenty six of this and thirty seven of that and you know, so on and so forth. Um but yeah, and then thanks to, what was it not uh, his trait? 
he just keeps adding to his collection of of yeah skills and everything skills um, and crafting but i don't know i think the kind of the progression is cool with it because it starts off you know bon aldwin's like thank you for your help you know freeing us from the goblins hey mm-hmm. i'm gonna ask for more help i need you to do this and that and you know, something as simple as eating that we don't really think a whole lot about, you know, he's able to give food to her, which then is helping out, you know, develop the settlement as a whole. Right. And, right. Yeah. That's like one of his first quests, right? It's, uh, yeah, yeah. Help us get resources and we get the first introduction to, was it house Trinaries? Um, first time that name comes up is, uh, a sponsor of the pioneer town. Yeah, um, yeah, because he's like, oh, well, you know, why do you need all this? And he's like, well, actually, I took out a loan, and, you know, I need to have everything being profitable going mm-hmm. forward, or I, have, I risk uh, going into a debtor's prison. Yeah, yeah, which we, we learn more about later on, right? Uh, yeah. The, it was a win-win for the loan givers. Um. But yeah, he then he goes around. Um, kind of want to keep the story going, but he interacts with the town. We get more. We get to learn more about the different NPCs, Rit and Jenkins, and access to um, the different town resources, so he can work on his crafting. Right, gets to mend the the sword drop from the skeleton which uh, is his faithful main hand weapon for a while there. Yeah. Um, I think he uses it throughout all of book one. I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, they do switch out armor a couple times, though. And yeah. It's pretty standard in any MMO, right? You start off with your your cloth and your leather and slowly scale up. Well, that, that's uh, another thing I felt like they did well with the realism. They mm-hmm. talk about them coming back one time and his, his complete arm of his armor is just completely gone. Right. Having to repair it. Right. He, and they actually have to repair it. It's not just, oh, I need so much of this base resource and just hammer, hammer. It's yeah. done. It's No, he actually has to go through and use the skills to craft and upgrade the armor and modify it. Um, which to me, just like the level of detail, uh, every gamer dreams for that in an MMO or a virtual MMO. Um, and then is it day two that the... Uh, no. Or is it day two or three that the rest of his party joins up with him? Uh, they meet up day three. Day two primarily is him making his armor, repairing his weapon... Uh, figuring out the cooking stuff, and then he also mm-hmm. makes the the copper pan and right. the uh, pots and the pans for Ragna. Then another cool part for me for character development is, um, he gets a, a piece of paper from Rit, pays back his debt there, and then he starts, you know, making his own map. And since he's got the prior right. independent game designer. Uh, yeah. background in real life it then you know translates into game to where now he's making a map yeah and that's pretty cool and one of the things that this book doesn't do but other lit rpgs do is um and i just thought of this the the interaction with the npcs and <laughs> their like reputation stats just feel so natural while so many other games and uh even lit rpgs you get that update like oh you did this well you moved from neutral to friendly or friendly to you know um trusted ally or yeah etc etc and Um, for this it's it's individually based mm kind of like jenkins when he first meets him he's like you know you don't know these people you're not going to save them i'm going to save them but then after Leary and helps him out. He's got a little bit more trust. Right. Yeah. Which is refreshing. I mean, um, it, again, it just adds that extra layer to the game slash storyline that not just anybody can come in and take over the town. 
Um, but yeah, there's so much towards the end of the book that I want to get to. What what else was newsworthy? Day two, pretty much uh, day world two, building, getting stuff set up. The uh, um, the bond talks to him about, hey, you're progressing. Uh, have you decided what you're going to pick for a class? Uh, oh, that's, that's where right. you have kind of the separation or, hey, reality check, this is the game. Because he stops talking and a menu pops up with the different classes. Mm-hmm. And so that's when he, he picks that he wants to be a spell sword, but he's not able, he's not met all the requirements. He's got a couple skills to grind. Get there. Right. Which I, it's refreshing um, and how they have like a branching uh, class system as well, where you you pick your base class at level 10, and then level 30, you get your advanced class, and level 70, you get your prestige class. But in order to play that class, which they don't really list it out, I mean, they suggest to him six or seven base classes. Um, But as we, we get to watch or we get to see in the rest of the book, there's so many different base classes alone. And then on top of that, you can pivot at level 30 and then pivot again at level 70, depending on how you play, as long as you have the supporting skill set to do that, right? Like, uh, he picks the spell sword and it's kind of like a hybrid mage, right? Yep, yep. Or or, uh, uh... mage warrior, mage rogue. Um, so he has to l- have so many spells and be such high level achievement or not, or skills and the different um, things. Just to kind of side note, going forward, we were talking about how many people are going to join and we were talking about it with the names, but mm-hmm. those were the only options that he had available to him at that point. I'm sure if he wanted to kind of get locked at nine and, you know, tried a bunch of other stuff, right. other, others, he would have more opportunities and different stuff. And That's true. That's yeah, I could see that. Um, I know they try not to do, they try to combat the, the meta gaming, but it would make sense. Right. Um, they talk about how in the capital they run them through a system of tests to try to help um, them focus on what their play style. Yeah, um, yeah, to see what they'd like. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, I really like the class system and how that progresses and gives you the feel of you could play your character however you want to play it, right? Yeah. Um, so day three is when um, everybody joins with us. The rest of the group has made it to where we're at now. Right. And uh, I kind of have a little <laughs> snippet. or Well, I thought it was funny, the interaction at the beginning, because the guard or the NPCs like halt, you know, who goes there? And right. they, they're just like completely dis- disheveled and, you know, swimming through dirt or whatever. So and they, they have like that, that bandits. Witty, witty banter. Yep. You get to see the, the party dynamics uh, very early on in the first official greeting, right? Yeah. Uh, something about like, aren't you the biggest group yep. of casuals or whatever I've ever seen or, the, or something like are that. Are you the filthiest group of casuals <laughs> I've seen this week? Uh, like gamer, gamer insults right there. They're uh, calling somebody that perceives himself as a hardcore player, a filthy casual. Um, there's either a lot of love or a lot of hate. But yeah, quick, uh, quick shout out on the diversity of the group. So Peter a.k.a. Constantine, um, ends up going with uh, a half-elf, um, wielding a short sword. Uh, Misa, Misha, Sierra. Uh, Full-blooded elf, red hair. Yep, yep. Uh, Zach, Caius, another half-elf in the group, but dark-skinned. So they, they have a diverse group going on. Um, and Halcyon, Heron, um, and then Decker, Trace, uh, another human. But they uh, 
they end up with a pretty balanced party based off of the way they build their base classes, right? You get yeah. the warrior, the spell sword, um, the warlock, a wizard, um, scout, I think is the term they use, scout type rogue. Or, yeah, they've got, sorry for how I've got it written, a rogue, a scout, a warlock, a mage, a warrior, and a spell sword. So a balanced group, but not your traditional um, clearly defined healer, clearly defined tank. Um, damage is just damage, right? Yeah. But not in this game. Like The different type of weapons you use and, and magic types play a role. Um, but yeah. And then the shortcut, right? They yeah. basically... Uh, uh Constantine who uh, really enjoys humor throughout the book like very nonchalant like uh you know he almost died get over it yeah so there was some fire no big deal um and then finally Larian's like hold up hold up hold up like you can't just you what I, I need the full story so I understand what's going on you're talking about you might be kill on site you're talking about uh you might be arrested on site um so without without going into too much detail, they basically run into this other party, right? The one that they overheard. And the other party pretty much kills the NPCs, turns to Constantine and uh, tells him to like drop all his gear to the ground and strip because um, they're going to rob him. And Constantine has other plans. And it's just like, again, the, the friendly back and forth banter at one point, like, Larian's like, okay, okay, you know, this sounded crazy, but, you know, I'm following your logic. This all makes sense. And they're just like, so, yeah, so naturally, he told me to drop all my stuff, and I, I told him to, you know, go suck a bucket of dicks. And it's like, yeah, so naturally, I told him to go suck a bucket of dicks. And, um, yeah, just the gamer banter, um, especially, I don't know about you, but late at night MMOs, some people could get a little bit colorful with uh, with their, their language <laughs> their language and their insults and whatnot. But yeah, so they get through it and it kind of foreshadows into Graves' um, challenges ahead, right? Because later on we yeah. learned that those same guys were part of that faction or part of that guild, if you will, group. Um, now they do really well with their foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. Another big part with get it, meeting all the people is uh, Sierra starts explaining kind of the uh, empire and how it all came to be. Right uh, now, I'm probably going to butcher this a bit, but uh, what I have is essentially the empire or the emperor wanted to ascend to godhood. Something took offense at it. And ended up, you know, raising cities to the ground, you know, messing everybody up. And where we're currently at, the noble houses kind of came together and brought them all over to Iberia, you know, where we know. And then that's where we had uh, the fight with the orcs, all that mm -hmm. moving forward. Um, we yeah, learned about. Go ahead. Sorry, I just. Um... One of the challenges I, I see with books sometimes is how to kind of work in the world building into the story without it feeling so long winded, right? Like, um, I don't know if you ever read Tolkien LOTR, but you could just like his world building could take pages and pages, and you're like, oh wow, this is great, but what the heck's going on right now? So to kind of yeah, where are we the, at? Yeah, get the the summary from a character and their little. Um, flare on it uh yeah the snippets which, yeah it was really refreshing um but yeah and name of the title ascend so ascend online um they get basically pushed off their homeland um uh sorry i cut you off there they they go through how was it the king and the prince both or, died in the final battle. Am I getting that right? Uh, uh, 
The thing I have down is Prince Rainier dies uh, right. following the retreat of the orcs. So right. they're kind of caught in a stalemate with the orcs for so long. And then the dark elves come in and start messing up the orcs from behind. There, mm-hmm. you know, the orcs start to retreat. Prince Rainier comes out and is like, hey, I'm going to capitalize on this. You know, they're retreating. Let's go ahead and finish them off. Well, then he overextends and gets taken out. Right. So that that basically gets us to where now we have an inexperienced ruler, um, a kingdom uh, essentially starting over again. And that's how we're colonizing um, Alford now, uh, essentially after the war, because prior to that, everything like it often does gets put into the war machine. And um, at one point when you're talking to the Vaughn, he talks about how, you know, all the specialists and experienced individuals basically passed away before they had time to pass on that knowledge because everything was focused on the war. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the lore is very interesting. Really curious to see about the different factions with the orcs and the dark elves moving forward. Um, but yeah. They uh, they do they go out day three do their first uh, yeah full yeah party? Af- after we get uh kind of the lift update the lore update um mm-hmm. he teaches them how to cook and he's like hey you know you can't regenerate and they they talk about that um he ends Burning up water. he he crafted armor for him and some weapons so he's now decking them out and some you know, not great gear but better than what they've got. Hey, kind of getting them back on their feet. It's a good party leader right there. Yeah. Here, here's some new gear for you. Let's let's go kill some stuff. Which, and they do. That that brings us into now that they've got six and they pass uh Lyrian party leader. Uh he gets a leadership skill and it just talks about all the different things you can do with it. You can increase like movement speed or health regeneration or Right. Something else, which I want to say, day at the end of day three, the uh, CTI development team is like, "Oh, if you're having a hard time on your story arc, remember to group up and team up." Right. So, yeah, there's brings it all together. There's several points where they really highlight that the goal is it to be um, group play, right? Yeah. Um, that you're kind of forced into it or whatnot, but yeah, I I like how they do the leadership skills, um, games that do that. Um, there's definitely more motivation to group up then and to keep playing with those strong leaders. Um, so you can get the speed buffs and the, you know, attack buffs and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah. And then while doing that, we, we see our nemesis again, right? Or yeah, talk. he takes them all out to the webwood because they're like, "How'd you how'd you level up so fast?" Yeah. Taking them out to the webwood, and yet again, the co- the the combat is amazing because you know Lyrian's already been there, and he's got an idea or an insight into how the combat with the spider works. Um, but you know, they're all kind of fighting individually, and I think it's Sierra gets grabbed by a web and he's got to try and save her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And not to jump around so much, but again, they learned so much in that first fight that when, after they get through this combat and the nemesis pounces on him um, and takes him out after they pull too much aggro from this huge swarm of spiders, um, he he wakes up later um, at his respawn in Alfred, and the Bond uh, kind of it, he's there for him, right? You know, sees that he's still kind of lingering on the death sickness. It's taken a little bit while for it to fade, so he pulls him over to the practice yard and starts working with him. And we learn more that he's actually a royal knight. Right, pretty much yeah. an exile himself. Um, and Lyrian has an opportunity to catch up on some of his skills 
Um, so much to the point where by the end of the day, his brain's basically in overload mode, right? Talks about how yeah, he has he a killer headache. Mm -hmm. So it shows us that there are some side effects or limit to downloading uh, skills into your brain. Um, but yeah, and then the next day, after they've had time to reflect, they're like, hey, this isn't just any other game, right? We actually need to fight as a team and work together as a team, um, which the the Bond kind of showed him on the practice yard as he was practicing with, with the militiamen um, and working on leveling them up too, right? Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he ends up facing off one-on-one -on -one with a duel, and then... You know, after that's only gone so far, he brings over the militiamen and he has Lyrian go up against four. He can't attack back until he survived four minutes without being hit. Right. And he ends up not necessarily hitting him, but using yet again more of his uh, his fighting style and grabbing the spear and kind of throwing him off balance and having them hit themselves. And it drives home that they've got to start working as a team. Mm hmm. Which makes sense. And again, uh, so back in the days of tab targeting, right? You just had to be in range and it just worked. Where yeah. with this with this level of detail in the combat, um, everything from how you swing or how you move together, there's uh, there's no passing through each other like you have in some MMOs. Um you, you go and you try to swing through your teammate, you're going to have friendly fire, which could hurt. Um, but yeah, I, I want to get to some of the um, big moments with Graves and whatnot later, because I, I find that whole interaction so interesting. But pretty much those couple days in the middle there, we're following them fall in love with the town and try to figure out how they want to play the game and, and if they should defend from, or not necessarily defend, but get ready for the adventurers. Cause they said it was seven days. If you went around the, the mountain cliff or whatnot, right? Yeah. Cause so, they burnt it down seven days to go around and they're trying to decide whether or not, Hey, are we setting up roots here? You know, cause he's like, this is where I ended up. Uh, you know, is this what we want to do? There's going to be a lot of work involved in protecting right. it and developing it. Right. And uh, they're they're pretty much like, uh, we wouldn't be here if we weren't interested. And um, yeah, and, and they go into full prep mode, right? Basically recruit this knight to help dig a ditch around the city and set up... Um, forget what they call them but basically like wooden spikes uh, or whatnot tribbly yeah if that sounds right um and then yeah just gearing everybody up leveling everybody up they they take the militiamen out to try to work on getting their skills up um and basically prepare the town and the NPCs, the, the story does a good job kind of showing their mental progression, too, after all these things happen. Um, try to think. It, does the, so they, they have a goblin attack early. And yep. then they one. have, yeah, and then they have the spiders attack, right? And that's yeah, before two days the adventure, later. right? So yep. here you are. Um, within the first week of gameplay and for this village, you know, it, it goes at normal time. So within a week they get attacked by two different monsters or factions, if you will. And then they're preparing for potentially a third. Um, and luckily before the adventurers show up, they have an opportunity to all get, uh, does Lyrian get his base class by that point? So day four, um, they're progressing the uh, the the military men. Um, they're working mm -hmm. on their skills. Everyone gets level ten except for Larian. Yeah, and they tease them about that, right? Yeah, they yeah. Know, 
they know how much he likes to uh, absorb all the information, so they they don't want to ruin it for him. Um, and again, you see that kind of that that party banter, if you will. Um, but yeah, and then uh, I'm trying to think. He doesn't get. He doesn't have his third encounter or whatnot with the Puma. Uh, before the, or before what? Before the spiders, right? That's after because after yeah, the spider yeah, that, attack, that's the whole the reason bond, he gets the puma, right? The bond says, "Hey, we'll focus on defenses. You go take care of these spiders." Um, or well, yeah. So at the end of the fourth day, they're winding down, everything's said and done, and then all of a sudden they're attacked by a you know a horde of spiders and a giant mm-hmm. glowing spider. Right. And the combat with that, yet again, is amazing. Yeah, you really get a... You, you feel like you're in the MMO. Um, but then after that, initially they plan to build up their defenses more and keep working on preparing for the adventures. But the Bond's mm-hmm. like, hey, uh, everybody's going to be really eager to work on the defenses. So you go ahead and go out and deal with the spiders. Right. That's what that's honestly where we find ourselves for most of the day. And from a gameplay uh standpoint, that makes sense. Like if an AI was had kind of like a priority tree, you would want them doing more of the combat quest type stuff, right? Instead of, hey, play um city builder, even though that's yeah. a, a part of it. Um well, the, go ahead. Uh, that's something I guess really comes in more book two or three for the city builder aspect. I almost went yeah. on a tangent, but that's not relevant. The big I, thing I, that was I, cool here was how after them going out, uh, helping the militia men, you know, figuring everything out, their armor's all beat up. So then Lyrian gets another stab at, you know, fixing them up. It's level ten, gets new insight, and then he makes the uh the spider armor and develops right. it. So Yeah. Yeah. Wearing the flesh of our enemies. Um trying to think which character has the spider phobia, because he, he's just has so many comical comments. I'm, I'm while... pretty sure it's Halcyon, because yeah. Yeah, the mage, because he's like, or he comes in and Lyrian's like, oh, I enhance her armor. Sierra's <laughs> like, oh, this is still it. And then Halcyon's like, uh, when did you think it'd be a good idea to put the flesh of our enemies? Right. Yeah. The level of intimidation. Yeah. Um, and then he, he jokes about the amount of therapy he'll need when he start running into the more intense yeah. spiders. And uh, yeah, just so many comical comments are along the way. Um, but yeah, and then, gosh, there's just so much in this book that I, I really want to cover, but don't want to go get get too lost in some of the details. But yeah, they... Lyrian finds the first part of the Surveyor's Guild's party, right, early on. Um, so, yeah, that's day two when he finds the Webwood. Um, right. There's a quest where he finds a boot. And he's like, oh, spiders don't wear boots. <laughs> so, yeah, finds the fir- finds Natasha, part of the Surveyor's Guild. Right, and then... Um... We get a little bit more of that storyline when they go back out to wear down the spiders. spiders. And yet again, the progression is beautiful because we're we started off with when Lyrian dies the first time with the Puma, there's an aberration and he gets hit by some magic and they're like, what's going on here? And then um, I'm trying to think of the progression after that. Oh, when they get attacked by the giant glowing spider, you know, at the beginning of the day, they're like, all right, something's going on here. Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, it's just the world, right? It's uh, that ruptured ley line that's leaking um, 
mana or whatnot, if you will, and affecting the creatures around it, you know, like an actual event. Yeah. Um, just playing out and the NPCs responding and delegating out quests in order to deal with it. Um, but yeah, and then we find the leader of the Surveyor's Guild kind of to keep keep the storyline moving along um, down by uh, on their way to try to find the ruptured ley line, right? As they're chasing his nemesis, his nemesis pretty much leads them back yeah. to it. And we start to see uh, just more of the lore in the world. It's not just some pioneer city. There's uh just all these the ancient Nefar. ruins yeah and, there's been yeah. a lot of development prior to them getting there and the, the nafar they're just kind of squatting or whatever in the situation but you know since the nafar is not there it makes you wonder why and then they kind of keep putting in oh hey i found a ruin prior and now we got this rupt- ruptured ley line right yeah and um they they handle it really well. You get to they get their first like world boss kill um, during that point, and Lyrian kind of continues to transform. He he already has scars from fighting the Puma, which has kind of disfigured him. And then when he falls into the ruptured ley line and goes through the process of turning his nemesis into the familiar, uh, his body gets affected, right? So yeah. here he was going to be the spell sword where he relies on mana and he basically uh gets ult- his mana regeneration. Yeah, it gets it gets completely tapped and he yeah, has to kind of adjust his play style from there. But there's some perks, right? He's able to see mana better. Um or he's got a true sight, able to see through illusions, and mm-hmm. uh, I forget the other stuff, but yeah, his mana vision has been overhauled. Right. Um, so I like how they do that. We get to hear more of the storyline as they go back, and then we hear about um, House... Uh, I really don't want to get Daenerys? This yeah, Daenerys, again because he lets it slip that they sponsored the expedition. They also yeah. sponsored Alford. Um, they also set him up with a loan. And when he goes and he talks to the bond, find out all the back history there that she basically didn't want. She, she could have ruled the kingdom, right? She was the queen. Yeah, regent. she could have been the queen, but she more or less stepped down and didn't want anything to do with it. So we got all these different seeds of different storylines and whatnot going on, and we're still preparing for the adventurers, right? Yep. So um, keeping an eye on the time, uh, oh. just um, do you, you want to try to get through all of this in one stream or? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, okay. we we can always revisit points. Um... In the next one. Yeah. But, or, yeah, with the progression for the next book. So they go through all this. Uh, we have all these storylines, and the adventures still haven't showed up, right? Yep. And, um, gosh, when he has this familiar, they're prepping, they send out their scouts, and they see that there's pretty much well over 100 adventures, right? And they look yeah. to be divided into three different factions inside the group um and they've so, got kind of the well-dressed uh adventures and they've got you know the ones that actually look fed but not mm-hmm. really any better off and then you've got you know basically slaves following them in tow right yeah and um you know they're they're completely preparing for the worst at this point right yeah, um, yeah, it does not look friendly at all. Yeah, so they they set everything up, they get ready for him, and they go out to meet him. And Graves is just basically like, "Well, this is unfortunate." Um, 
I guess my buddies didn't make it or whatnot. And it was just like a complete brush off and yeah. try to bribe them. And while he's trying to quote unquote bribe them, um, they're communicating with the rest of their party as they notice that two surprise attacks are getting launched on their city and kind of go from there. Um, One of the things I really liked with their, when we first meet Graves is kind of the insight into how big um, Ascend Online is gearing up to be and kind of Graves' motivation behind it. He's like, oh, no one's going to care that I've got slaves in tow. No one's even going to know. It's just going to be a new sitcom for them to, you know, watch as they go through their dreary lives. And Yeah, that's the first time that um, our main characters really realize how big the games become. Right? Yeah, like, they've just been emerged. At this, yeah, because they haven't logged out at this point. They stay logged in for the full first 10 days. Um, but that's when they drop that there's nearly... 200 million people on the waiting list um and oh. yeah like talk about success for a video game uh, but yeah the the streaming he justifies oh it's just a game even though we talked about in the terms uh of user agreement how real it is to everybody in there and that it asks the morality questions and they get into a discussion about it after the fact about how could you think it was okay to pretty much enslave your fellow man, game or not, because um, it's so real. Um, and I, then... Oh, they, go ahead. Lyrian kind of touches on, like, it's not the game's point, or it's not for the game to decide your morality. It's for the game to provide options and for you to utilize them for your entertainment. And then he goes on to say um, several games he's played, or he can list a half a dozen that have had slaving empires. And they kind of have that back and forth where they're like, no, it's not okay. Yes, it's always been there. And, uh, so I don't know, that was a big insight on all that. Um, right. They uh, during that interaction as well, like it just asked so many questions about morality and what's okay um, and what's appropriate because you get to see uh, like this demon, right, or this force that's kind of controlling him. Uh, yeah, yeah. The end of the exchange after. Um, they've defended the town and everything. Uh, it's it's like the demon that points at him first or whatnot, this spirit that he can see around Graves. And then Graves turns and looks at him. Yeah. So, um, it, and yet again, that's only possible due to Lyrian falling into the ley line and getting his true sight ability. Yeah. Always nice when uh, when events in the world set you up for success like that. But, yeah, I don't know. Like, again, how, how comfortable would you feel playing a video game knowing that you're logged in until you log out and pretty much have the system essentially at that point control you, right? This NPC demon that can kind of, like, invade your thoughts or whatnot. Um. Yeah, that, that'd be a bit much for me. But yet again, kind of like going forward when we start talking to Freya and Thorn and Helix, Lyrian is like, oh, well, why were you even putting up with this? Why didn't you just log out or re-roll? And, you know, that's when we finally get the insight into uh, the logging out system, how you never really leave the world you're always going to be a part of it. Uh, there's just an NPC that kind of seeds your body and you can, like queue up tasks and whatnot. And then it comes back with the whole um, re-rolling is kind of impossible because you got to go to the back of the waiting list. And you lose your subscription fee in the process. And yeah, it's yeah not you've got to you've got to repay for everything. It's no fifteen dollars a month WoW subscription the way they make it out to be, and with with all that nanotechnology and live in pods and everything, um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
So they they hoped for the best, prepared for the worst. Um, first fight with Graves, they they really lucked out by having their base classes, which is one of the only reasons why they could withstand so many out. attackers yep. and had the good defenses to set up a uh, a choke point on the bridge and using the NPCs to their advantage when they needed it and having it a, a, a actual healer certainly helped. So again, like they managed to fend off all these people, but it, it felt balanced to me, or at least realistic, right? Not yeah, that yeah. The characters and... were overpowered in what they were doing. Well thought out strategy. Um, it was all planned out. Like they knew Lyrian had the best mobility, so they went to confront him. And if anything went south, they had you know hand signs for cues to when to engage. And they also had you know Lyrian was the guy to get in and get out. And due to him stabbing Graves in the throat. You know, that led to Graves' side kind of um, falling apart because instead of following what they should have done, instead of Graves being able yep. to stop them from attacking fortified defenses. He couldn't talk until he healed, right? Yeah. And so they lost a lot of people in that first wave and their respawns were back at Alberia um, yeah. seven days away. So he let slip that he is pretty much there to set up a kingdom, right? And he needs so yeah. many people to follow him and all this stuff. So they kind of thwart that a little bit at the beginning. And um, after the battle, when we follow up with Graves, we, we get to see that rage. Um, the next... Yeah. Or continuing with that, after we deal with Graves, the next big part for me, talking to Freya, Thorn, and Helix, and all them, is how it, our main group deals with it all, and the way I feel you're walking through it with them. Because yeah. um, they're like, we've got all these people, what do we do? And then you get the, the banter, or not really, but... Um, them talking over how they can get people involved and they apply a lot of like real world experience to it. Like, Hey, let's have them buy in. So by them, you know, providing something they feel involved and they feel like it's theirs and a piece of Mm -hmm. it. And, um, yeah, just that whole interaction did a lot for me. Yeah, it, you're right. You you feel like you're just another party member kind of riding along as they, they work through how best to handle it. And um, they get more settlers. And the the city was already, or the city, the town, Pioneer Town, Alford, uh, was already kind of growing. Uh, and then you add all this extra labor to it, and they get this buy-in, and things just start popping up, right? And they they pretty much go into phase two of gearing up to go after graves and deal with some of the prisoners that they have captured in town. Yeah, and um, that was something they thought would have been a pretty cut and dry. Hey, the adventurers come, we deal with it, it's over. But because of the whole situation, it ends up, hey, it's it's not done. We've got to deal with graves, and we've got to you know put forth more. Right don't want to leave him out there about on his own. So they take all these people in, they have their buy-in. They, they give them the benefit of the doubt. And it's because of one of those parties that they get their next lead on graves. Right. Yeah. Um, Yeah. One of them uh, joins Alford, gets a spawn reset, goes out and then they get netted by the goblins again. And one of their allies actually ends up killing them. That way they can come back and tell them. And due to the party sense, they're able to figure out where it is. Yeah. And um, not to jump around too much, but something that kind of made me think. They, they could track their party, the allies' party with party sense, but they also have um, one of the guys they capture kind of defect from graves and say, you know, I, I was more scared than anything than than willfully complying. I just want to enjoy the game. 
and yeah. he's still in Graves' party. So what I thought was interesting is they used that. They used the two different um, parties to keep track of the allies and the enemy faction Graves. Wouldn't Graves also see them coming, though? Like, if he was paying attention? Well, they, they mentioned that yeah. as when they started getting closer, he's like, hey, you know, he's should be pretty close. Uh, we might want to move or do something um, because party sense works both ways. And that yeah. kind of comes out when they finally find the goblin camp because, you know, it's, it's come out of the woodworks that graves and the goblins are working together and we right. get a little bit more lore into the Nafar and where graves finds his armor and everything. Yeah. Find out that it's slave King. Yeah. Uh, what's deal. his name? Yeah, so um, virtual virtual reality, right? It's gonna do things you uh, society wouldn't allow, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then also, kind of on that that graves bit before we set out, um, gets netted, and he realized that it's graves and the goblins, and then there's Carver, and that kind of raises the whole morality point mm-hmm. again. Because we saw Graves being controlled by the evil spirit or Slave King Abdul, but Carver um, was just being He's... cruel for no particular reason, no additional thing that we could see. He's just dark, right? We we hear yeah. from um, the new allies, yeah, Freya, Horn, and Felix, right? That um, you know he did things just just because right he would cripple yeah. people just because um yeah yeah we could probably do a whole stream on the morality behind vr and mmo and you know where where's the line in the sand on what's okay and what's not um to be able to pretty much just torture people in game um yeah but anyway, it it has some dark moments towards the end there. Um, yeah, they go. We we get to see uh, the party's passion for fire again yep. as yep. Uh, they're they're fighting their way in, and Lyrian falls on a fire pit, and he's just like, "Hmm, I well, know what." <laughs> we're here to have some chaos anyway. Let's just burn the place down. Right. And uh, they get called out like, "What's what's your guys' obsession with fire?" And is this uh, a reoccurring thing? And it's like it's becoming one. Yep. Um, earlier, I think like uh, tried when to they set had the, the with the spider quest, they tried right. to set the forest on fire. Oh, we got a thousand of them to kill. I wonder if we could just burn the forest down. And it's like <laughs> I can't believe I have to even say this. No forest fires. I mean, <laughs> they they get they get it in the end though I guess, uh, or not in the end, but when they go to take on Graves, um, but yeah, manage to defeat it, kind of drop some other little story arcs there as uh, what's his name, Cavard, um, Cobalt. I'm so bad with the names. The half orc. Carver, yeah. Um, as he gets away, as he lets loose the mana wraiths. I uh, I don't remember what they're called, but essentially the Nullment Spire like saps all the mana and right. turns them into. Yeah. Which is why it answers the question why they were capturing them instead of just killing them outright, right? Um, that... Ever from the beginning. When yeah, yeah, yeah. They were trying to abduct the villagers. Um, it was, was always a question of why. Go, go ahead. Yeah, that was another good build up or little foreshadowing moments, like you know, day one getting dropped into Alford. Um, the goblins are netting or capturing or trying to capture the townspeople uh, with Natasha's expedition for the. Um, surveyors guild mm-hmm. they're they're trying to capture them and then with the slave king it all kind of comes together that um 
the Nafar or the Slave King guy. Uh, sorry, the goblins worship the Nafar. And kind yeah, of bring it all together. Yeah, that that's part of the reason why Graves lost control, right? He had to let the Slave King um, pretty much yeah, barter he, for them. Yeah, he was them. about to be taken out by the goblins, and the Slave King wakes up and tells him to give him control. Right. Yeah. So, um, and I think it, throughout that process, when he t- takes on the Slave King, is that when he gets um, altered again? Where? Oh, yeah. For Lyrian, uh, what happens there is graves, or so the shaman, the goblin shaman knocked the nullment spear out of the raw. Uh, mana, a raw ether that's going on. Um, Graves jumps into it. The Slave King separates or gets his own corporeal form. And then when the only way that Lyrian is able to manage to defeat him, he grabs a Nullment Spire, which it's kind of like overloading his body in both ways. He falls into the Ley Line, which is pure mana. And that kind of like overloads him that way. And then he touches the Nullment Spire. And that's when now his body is kind of like mana starved. And right. Yeah, yeah. And again, the pros and cons to the new changes, right? Yep. He uh, He's definitely going to be an interesting kind of spell sword. Um, trying really hard not to, to get into too much of the other books. I only want to do spoilers for the first book. Um, but yeah. Any any other thoughts on that that final battle with the goblins? The combat again, I mean, we, we keep talking about it, but now that we have we went from a party of six to sometimes with the militia to now we're getting a larger party size. Like we're talking raids. We went from, you know, your your solo player to your party player to your um, NPC uh, slash like raids and so on and so forth. Um, wonder if we're going to have like full scale battles before all this is said and done. Yeah, one point I don't think we we touched on that was really intriguing for me. Um, after Graves, the first battle with him, we're talking to the slaves or the people that we've got back and they mentioned cold scar and kind of graves does too. And how all the guilds were the first ones to get there and they kind of set up shop and it was hard to really have anything working for them, but um, that they're already fighting with the dark elves. So that for me is a big point to where I could totally see the other faction or kind of like Horde versus Alliance kind of coming right. out. Because we knew where we wanted to end up. We knew what we could choose. We've only seen a slight snippet of this side of the world. And that would be true. something that I... it They do so well foreshadowing. Because kind of like all through book one, he's like, Oh, I found two ruins. I found this first one. And mm-hmm. nothing really comes of it mm-hmm. until, you know, later. But... That's that's the one thing that I've I've realized and I want to see it expanded on. Yeah. I uh Yeah, it, at one point they they asked with the goblins if they could be goblin player characters. Um yeah. so that could just open up a whole other side of all this, right? And then at the beginning, I think when he was picking his classes, I think they did say orc, which those were the guys who are fighting with. That's right. The, they had to uh, pick certain classes to get the starting place together. Yeah, because right? we, we meet uh, Thorn and Helix and all them and the Thunder Lizards. And they, <laughs> they had a different um, starting point. But, you know, just the fact that Orc was even listed in the character creation kind of yeah. opens up, well, you know, oh, man. a lot more. The, the next 
geek out session we're doing is over book quote unquote 1.5. Um, but that's not part of the main story arc. So I wonder if we'll get some of those other factions as the, the storyline progresses, little snapshots of, hey, this is what happened on the other side of the world, right? And get yeah. it from their point of view um, and so on. But yeah, um, getting close on time could really go into a lot of detail towards the end there. But something I really enjoyed uh, was as like they go and face all these trials and tribulations, right? Um, Lyrian really plays up and and takes his leadership uh, role very seriously. And like towards the end, after they, they go through this huge big battle um, to defeat Graves and the Slave King, he, he, gets everyone in the town hall and just holds an announcement. And uh, yeah, it, it makes sure to really build up all the players and their contributions, talking about how people made sacrifices for the greater good and kind of builds into what they're trying to create in this village. And um, it, it all leads up after the positive feels to the announcement of the guild, right? Like up yeah, to this point, yeah. it, they've just been doing um, individual party play, if you will. But uh, the guild Virtus, where pretty much they plan to be the white knights of the area and the defenders. And that's that's the whole theme. So if people want to be a part of this, um, that's what they're signing up for. And that's where they leave off, right? We pretty much get through. Yeah, that's the last little snippet. The whole and first. Just, Go the ahead. progression is great because you start off, it's always designed to be at least a group interaction, but right. you get separated. So it goes from solo play to party play to, yep. you know, kind of like raid esque play to the final snippet we see is, hey, you know, you've seen the good, the bad, the ugly, everything in between. Here's what our virtues is or our virtue and what we're going to stand for. And you end up, you know, right at the end, they want to form a guild. Yeah. The progression is great. Oh, I I love it. And it it really does a good job setting it up. Um, So much happens that there were times I forget it's, it was just 10 days of gameplay. Granted, they were logged in the whole time. So uh, you could definitely get a lot more done when you're literally playing all waking hours and sleeping hours. Um, but yeah. I, I feel like they kind of overloaded a couple of those days. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with but, you. But it kind of covers it too. Like, they go to sleep, they get attacked by the Webwoods. And then Lyrian's like, oh, well, I guess I'm not going to sleep. I got shit to do. Yeah. You know, and he goes off on his, his tangent. But And they and they kind of touch on that, too, about how they're tired. And, you know, hey, I wonder if uh, they have coffee in this world or if I can corner the market. Right. Yeah. The, uh, the basic necessities in life, right? As yep. much as we want to escape reality. Uh, uh, I, I'd I'd be looking for coffee too, um. But yeah, thanks uh thanks for geeking out with me on book one, Pete. Uh, any final thoughts about the book? I know that we were talking about offline before we even talked about doing this geek out session. We've probably been through this book at least half a dozen times. It's yeah. uh it's a good one, and then several more as getting ready for this geek out session um check out links below after the stream i'll make sure to update all the necessary links uh next geek out session we're going to do the second book or more commonly referred to as book 1.5 and um my first time through i had mixed feelings about it because I yeah, I just fell in love with the main storyline. So 
I was really tempted to go to book three or book two um, before going back and doing book 1.5. Yet it's uh, it's worth reading. I'll I'll pull up the um. For me, book 1.5, so to speak, at first time through, I felt the same way. It didn't really grab me as much, and I, I really liked what we had built for the first book. But after re-listening to it, it adds a certain dynamic that you start realizing more and more about it. And that... Uh, It just it really helps develop the world and kind of like I was saying with uh, Cold Scar and how that is happening in the world and we have no insight on it. They talk talked very briefly about it, but now you know this is an uh, insight into a different group. So it's definitely worth the second read if you haven't read it the first time. Yeah, it. Uh, I'm I'm right there with you. It. I enjoy. Hell to pay, and I'm looking forward to doing the geek out session, um, same time, 6 p.m. Eastern, uh, next Sunday, May 19th. And I really didn't appreciate it until I got to the third book or number two, depending on how you look at it. But Hell to pay, uh, next Sunday, if you haven't read the first book and you've been hanging out with us anyway. You got time to get through that, um, get through hell to pay to join us in the live stream. And um, yeah, I know I've already asked, but final thoughts, Pete? Uh, phenomenal series. I can't wait for more. I look forward to the day that uh, we we have some MMOs on this level. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, they they always tease you with it because like certain things just max out the time scale so far. But yeah. this one is yeah. like eh, just on the cusp. You know, I could see my kids getting into it, and yeah, we're we're already there with the 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 virtual reality as we know it. It's not too far, but then they they kind of you know give you the insight of uh, the cost and everything else and. Uh, yeah it'd be yeah. it'd be cool yeah and uh if it works like this where when you log out your your avatar pretty much keeps working um filthy casuals like me could uh still play with my buddies um on raid nights at least and let uh let my ai do my dailies for me yeah yeah that's that's something that's kind of sad as much as i talked about all the mmos we did and you know, coming out and would love to do. I I don't have the time for it. My biggest thing right now is Hearthstone. Yeah, you, know, you, you, casual you, could couple, game. you could play a couple games of that and put it down. And if you don't get to it later in the week, you don't worry about yeah. um it affecting your your raid loot uh, metrics or whatnot to yeah. where it's pretty much becoming um a part time job. But yeah. Thank you, everyone, who was able to join us for the live stream. And um, for those of you watching this afterwards, feel free to leave some comments in the chat uh, about your thoughts of the book. Um, First MMOs you got into. Yeah, I'm kind of curious. It uh, kind of tells your age a little bit uh, yeah. when, when you ask people what their first MMO was. Uh, if you'd like to support this channel, please share it with a geek in your life. And I hope to geek out with you guys again here soon. Thanks. Bye.